Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes. I'm here to talk to you today about the Pumpkin Eater by Penelope Mortimer. Um, this is a dagger of a book. It just sort of stabs you and hurts right in the heart, or in my heart anyway. And I think a lot of the Walking Book Club group felt the same. So this book, it was written in 1962 and it feels very much of its time. It's about a woman um, who is a wife of her third husband and has countless children, um, but is very, very unhappy. In fact, she, she has a nervous breakdown and she, she decides to have another baby. Um, everything's sort of going wrong in her marriage. Her husband's having all these affairs and it's as though she grabs the only thing she can to try and make it better again, which is in having another baby. Um, of course, 60 years on, so much has changed for women and yet it still felt so current, so relevant. And in our discussion in the group, I think we felt it was because the book's so well written and that there are all these kind of internal discussions and decisions that, that the narrator makes and it feels like those kind of sort of internal conversations are almost what we, we all have on our own all the time, you know, about so much in life and, um, and still the decision whether or not to have a child or another child feels weighted with, with so much. Um, I'm going to read a little bit out from the book and I'm going to discuss it a little bit and then at the end of the video I was really honoured to be joined by Lucy Scholes who is a great critic and writer and seemingly the world expert on Penelope Mortimer so um, I asked her a few questions about the book. So I thought I'd just read a bit out. This is in the heart of the book, it's on page 92 um, in this Penguin edition. The book is told from from the perspective of the narrator, so it's in the first person, um, I did, I did this, I did that, um, and it's in the past tense. Um, and then there's this very uncanny bit right in the middle where it switches into the present tense and it becomes all sort of ventriloquized through Jake, in a way, her husband. Um, and it felt so unnerving and troubling and powerful, this bit, it's very arresting. Um, Jake has just found out that his wife is going to have another baby or is pregnant again. And um, this is his supposedly kind of honest reaction. It felt very troubling that these thoughts really could only be voiced through Jake. Um, anyway, I will, I will read it out. He starts by saying that he is not a good person like I am, but he doesn't say what he means by good he says that he is weak and patient and not to be trusted. He has done his best in the past, but even then he has failed me, dismally failed me. Does he believe this? Why this sudden humility? I want to believe it. I want to shut my eyes and be lapped by lies. Jake is humble. He knows what's wrong with me. He's given me all the wrong things, material things. He's neglected me. Perhaps this is true. He has never spoken like this before, rather too solemn, a bit pompous. He feels about this, he means it. Jake is trying to say something he means. Because of this short-sightedness of his, I came to feel my life was pointless and empty. Quite rightly, so it was. I was perfectly right to feel like that. And since he was no help to me, I took the only way out that I knew. I decided to have another child. He is not blaming me. Jake is blaming himself. Is he saying I didn't know any better? Well, if he is, it's true. His first reaction was that he had been cheated. This, he says, is why he behaved so badly at the cremation. Then, after seeing me there, he began to think. Jake began to think. He thought it out and he realised that it was he who had cheated me. He had left me in a vacuum and I had simply grabbed what I could get, the only thing I could think of to make me happy again. All right, all right, Jake, go on. The fear is eased, the fire is warm, love is simple. Somebody is explaining things to me, understanding me. I'm resting now, I'll believe anything. He isn't excusing himself, but he's been terrified by the task of supporting us all. 
For years, he's been driven on by panic, taking on ghastly scripts he didn't want to do, accepting everything he was offered, destroying, incidentally, his own talent in the process. But that doesn't matter. The point is that he's kept us. We've come out of it alive. But the irony, the bloody irony of it is that just at this point, when he has realised how much he loves me, when we could for the first time start planning a happier, more sensible life, just at the point when we could start thinking of a little freedom, I'm pregnant again. The whole thing starts all over. Instead of love and a good time, he doesn't of course mean a good time, he means a good time. And being able to go away together and see a bit of the world, broaden our horizons, enjoy what he supposes is our middle age. Instead of all this, another child. To him it's tragic. We could have lived so differently, but now it's tragic. Now he stopped talking. The caves of the fire blaze with icicles. Stalactites seen through tears. I don't speak because he has something left to say. Of course he knows, good God, he knows that the idea of abortion is repellent to me. It is to him too. He would never dream of suggesting it. I must agree that he never has. It's only that the doctor, that psych, did say that I shouldn't have another child. I'm in the middle of treatment, Jake says, for depression. An abortion would be perfectly legal. It wouldn't be underhand, nasty, anything like that. Still, he supposes that the only thing to do is to take the risk and have the baby and get down to work again. They want him to go to Hollywood for six months. He was going to turn it down, take the summer off. He had wanted to get to know the children again, he says. He wanted to take them out and dust them and polish up their faces. Now, oh well, that's life. Don't be upset, darling. Don't cry. I want to make you happy. Good God, after all, he's got me into this. All those boring months, the pain at the end. He only wishes he could get me out of it while there's still time. I still say nothing. He's right. I believe him, but I can't say so. I feel myself like a torrent being damned, being forced back, turned into new channels. I am a dead weight, like water. It's a pretty powerful piece. And, um, and you can see maybe from that how the book does really kind of grab you. And it's a, it's a really affecting book. Um, it's pretty grim, but pretty miserable, but we did find an element of hope in it in, um, in the narrator's oldest daughter, Dinah, who's very much, she very much mirrors um, the narrator. There's even a bit where Jake buys them the same dressing gown from his trip to Morocco. Um, when the narrator, the mother, sort of disappears off having a kind of episode, um, Dinah is the one who looks after the the, chil the younger children. And there's even a scene in a party where she's sort of s seen as kind of growing up a bit, um, which mirrors an earlier scene. So there's this kind of parallel of Dinah, except that unlike the narrator, Dinah is able to look out into the wider world. She suddenly gets really interested in Trotsky. Um, she becomes interested in religion. Um, and one hopes as, as someone in the book club said that, you know, a couple of years later, um, she would read Betty Friedan and become in, enlightened and, um, and have a better life than, than her mother, the narrator. Um, but I think the fact that this book still resonated so, so strongly with us all made me feel that, you know, lots has changed, but maybe not enough. Maybe these decisions still remain incredibly hard, whatever whatever the outside circumstances. Um, so now here's a little bit of Lucy. Thanks again, Lucy Skulls. And um, looking forward to see you next, seeing you next time. Very much a book of the 60s, the early 60s, and possibly sort of the late 50s feeding into it. Um, but it still felt to me incredibly fresh when I first read it and really kind of radical, uh, which I think it was for its time, obviously. And so, um, yeah, I think I, I, mean, I still remember reading it for the first time and then thinking this is someone I want to read more of. This is a, you know, a woman, a, a writer. I want to kind of find out more about their life, their work, way, all sorts. For me, that often is a sign yeah, of really, really great literature, right? That it can have some kind of, it ha you know, it is of its moment um, and it kind of draws on stuff that's happening at the time it's written. But also it doesn't really matter that, you know, we can read it how many years down the line, what is it now, like 60 years down the line and still find resonances today 
I mean, there's obviously something slightly depressing about that as well, because it is about the loss of women and having to <laughs> reconcile themselves to domesticity and some of the problems with motherhood. Um, but I think, you know, I just think that's a sign of a, of a really good writer. You know, you read, I read a lot of books for, um, like you say, for my work, I'm always reading old books and trying to work out whether there's a kind of, whether there would be a market for them or an interest in them today. And some of them are really great, but they are sort of period pieces that don't seem to resonate. But I think Mortimer, for me at least, she really, really does. And so it's great to hear that, you know, your, your uh, members of your book group felt the same. So then I asked Lucy what she thought of that passage I read out earlier, um, which is told through Jake, as it were. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very, I mean, that is a very poignant part of the novel. I think it's interesting as well, but I don't know how much you um, you talked about sort of Mortimer's own life, but obviously this book was incredibly autobiographical in many ways. Um, it, I mean, it was all but memoir. She changed names, obviously, but so much of it had happened to her. And I think that it's really interesting that although it is the kind of it is the vocalization of sort of what she maybe couldn't say in her own life. So she wrote it down. But then at the very heart of it, there's something there where she still can't quite grasp the I suppose because that it's such a problematic it's such a problematic thing to have happened, right? That, you know, you make a decision because you've got, because you've got the information there, you know, the character makes the decision based on what people are telling her, based on what she thinks is gonna be right. And then it turns out to be completely the wrong thing. So I think you have to have that, or I like the way that it sort of does that sort of switch there because you realize that actually a decision that she thinks is kind of, a decision that she thinks has been hers to make has actually not because she hasn't been given all the evidence. Maybe that's the way I think of it. Absolutely. and. Um... So here we are, members of Emily's Walking Book Club on Zoom for now. We actually had to have two sessions in the end. Um, it was the day the clocks changed that caused a um, sort of technical glitch. Um, but we had two absolutely brilliant discussions. Um, thank you so much for joining me to talk about another great book. This was Penelope Mortimer's The Pumpkin Eater. <laughs>